Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Babbling Books. If it's your first time here, my name is Elaine. So this is going to be my August wrap up. I read um, seven physical books. I listened to two audiobooks and I also DNF'd two books. Um, if you hear me pause and take a big breath, please excuse me. Um, the humidity is horrible right now in Texas. It rained a couple of times very lightly, not enough to cool anything down. So it's been over a hundred degrees, I don't know, for three or four weeks now. Um, so the humidity is just awful. On top of that, this is um, the season for ragweed and it's just really bothering um, my asthma. So just bear with me. Um, and that's it. So let's get into it. These books are not in any particular order. I just stacked them over here on this step stool. Um, I need to get a book cart. So to start with, we have The Woods Are Always Watching. So this is a YA horror thriller novel. Um, the premise is two girls, uh, Nina and Josie. Let me make sure I got that right. Um, it is their summer before college and one of the girls is going to college like a thousand miles away and they decide that they're going to go on a three day hike, um, in a place called the Pisgah National Forest, which is a real place. And it seems like it's, um, sort of at the lower end of the Appalachian Mountains, but do not quote me on that. I am terrible at geography, but I looked it up when I started reading this. So, um, these girls have no experience with hiking. They live in an area where hiking is very, very common. A lot of their families hike, their friends hike, but these two girls don't. So they borrow some equipment, they look up some stuff online, they get advice from people, and they go. And it's like an I Love Lucy, I Love Lucy episode, Lucy and Ethel. Um, but it wasn't, <clears throat> their mistakes are not comical, for the most part, um, there's a lot of uh, them hashing out their problems with each other, um, some fights and arguing, some truths are revealed, and then something happens and the whole thing sort of spins into a horror story. Um, if you like Criminal Minds, you're really going to enjoy this book. Um, I ended up giving it a four star rating and then I went and looked for more books by this author and much to my surprise, um, this is the author that wrote There's Someone in the House or Your House, which I DNF'd. Um, so I'm really glad that when I bought this, I didn't make the connection because I probably wouldn't have read it. That just goes to show sometimes you may not like something an author writes, but you'll like something else. So, very much recommend this one. I found it to be very enjoyable. That's probably one of my favorites in August. And I read This Is Our Story by Ashley Elston. So, five teenagers, um, all friends, go into the woods and they are hunting. And they hear a shot and they all converge thinking somebody has, you know, shot a deer. And they find one of their friends, one of the five, dead. He's been shot and killed. And you read from their perspective. So you start to, well, right at the beginning of the story, you realize that, I want to say on page three, that the boys have all agreed that they're just going to keep their mouth shut. And as long as they don't talk, the police can't figure out what happened. And there's also the perspective of the shooter. And you can sort of see how he's manipulating things from his point of view. And then the main character is a girl named Katie. She works at the DA's office and she is determined to figure out what has happened. I did enjoy this. Um, I, it was entertaining. I wouldn't say I felt like it was an edge of your seat. I didn't find it overly thrilling, um, but it was a solid book and I would read more by this author. Um, maybe, I think I just would have preferred a little bit more horror in it because that's what I was in the mood for, but it was still a solid read. And then, <laughs> this is one of the DNFs, The Campbell Lake Summer Camp Massacre. 
a horror B book by Lewis Stone. So this is a self-published novel and it's supposed to be cheesy and tropey. I mean, cause it's a, a B, a B book, like, uh, like a play on, you know, a B movie. Um, I got about five pages in and I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't finding the tropiness and the cheesiness entertaining. I was like rolling my eyes a lot. So excuse me, I DNF'd this and I'm going to put it back on my shelf to read maybe in October. Maybe I'll be more in the mood for that. The other DNF, The Game by Lindsay Miller. So I'm going to pass this on to my son because I think he would enjoy it. Um, so the premise of this book is the seniors at this high school, they play a game every year called Assassin and they're split into groups and each group has a target and there's rules you have to follow. They're very careful to make sure that nobody is put into real danger because if that happens, they know that the adults will stop, um, the game. They'll never be able to play it again and they'll be known as the class that killed the game. So... Um, my problem with this book was the dialogue felt awkward, um, and forced and it sometimes just plain confusing. I had to stop a couple of times and backtrack to figure out who was talking. Um, so I just wasn't enjoying reading it. So this is, just isn't for me. So I'm passing it along to my son because the premise sounded fantastic, but I just, the execution, um, didn't, I guess, meet my expectations. Um, another horror, Campfire by Sean Sorrells. So a family, um, along with extended family, I want to say there's three family units and the main character's best friend. They go camping. And when they sit around the campfire, they start telling horror stories. So one of the interesting things about this book is the horror stories are not um, they're not told through dialogue. There's actually a chapter where the person starts telling the story and then the whole next chapter is you reading it like a little short story. So that happens three or four times. I did find that enjoyable. I didn't like any of the characters. There was a misogynist, a, almost, I want to say an abuser. Um, there was like a bumbling buffoon um and I don't know it just I just really didn't enjoy it but the, my biggest issue with this book is at least the first 80% of this book is about the personality clashes at the campsite and secrets kind of being revealed and the last 15 to 20 percent is when the killing starts the murder start the death start however you want to put it and that's not what I wanted. I wanted a book where the majority of it was these people fighting to survive and that's not what this was. So I ended up giving this a three star because it's relatively well written, um, but I just didn't enjoy reading it. So if you're looking for like a slasher, this is not it. Um, but you know, I would try another book by that author, but I just really didn't like the way it was structured. And my favorite book of the month was Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. I read this um, in um, my junior or senior year of high school, so 20, 22 years ago. And I remembered that I enjoyed it, but I didn't remember much about it. And I like Westerns. Um, I love John Wayne movies, and I've been known to tear through um, historical romances that take place in um, the Old West. So this is just, so I, I, I figured that if I reread this, I was going to love it. And I did. So you have two main characters named Gus and Call. Gus and Call are um, old Indian fighters. They are in their 60s when the book starts. And they have a livery stable um, on down in South Texas on the border, um, of Mexico. And they were Texas Rangers, but they mostly tried to keep the, um, Texas 
peoples, white peoples, say from the Native Americans. So there is a lot of racism in here. Um, but, you know, I was really surprised because Gus, there were a lot of really great discussions where he spoke about what they had done to the Native Americans and how that affected Texas. Um, so I thought that was really well done, but there's a ton of trigger warnings in here. There is so much misogyny. There is, um, violence, um, racism. Oh, and, uh, like my favorite was a, a lady of the night. If you get my drift, she's not referred to in any delicate manner. She's referred to by using a slur that starts with W. Uh, I got tired of that pretty quick. Um, lots of different points of view, which I thought was going to be horrendous, but it was actually very enjoyable because it paints this very beautiful, descriptive picture, realistic picture of what it was like to live in a territory, um, in a place where it was almost lawless. So very much enjoyed this one. Um, I'm going to read the next book. Um, which is called Streets of Laredo. Um, I'm very much looking forward to that, and I very much recommend this one. Um, also, trigger warnings for sexual assault and for um, animals being harmed. Um, I don't know if it makes a difference. There's only one case where an animal was harmed purposefully, so just be aware of that. But I very much recommend this one. I mean, it's a really really big book, but it didn't feel tiresome. I, every time I picked it up, I was excited. So give that one a try. It was very good. And then I read a middle grade book called One Crazy Summer by Rita Williams Garcia. So as you can see, this one is one, four awards it looks like. So we have the Scott O'Dell Award for Historical Fiction, Newbery Honor Book, uh, Coretta Scott King Award winner, and a National Book Award finalist. So this is a story of three um, little girls that um, they're sisters and they um, live in um, New York and they live with their father and their grandmother, um, their father's mother. And this summer they are flying in an airplane for the first time, it's 1968, and they are going to stay with their mother in Oakland, California. The oldest girl remembers a few things about her mother, the younger two girls, hardly anything at all. Their mother has been incredibly uninvolved and the grandmother speaks very badly about her. So the oldest girl is, she's not really looking forward to this visit. She doesn't think it's going to go well. <clears throat> and she's partially right. So, there is no drug abuse. There's no alcoholism. There's nothing like that in here. But the girls, once they get to their mother, they are somewhat neglected. The mother makes sure their basic needs are met, but you can tell she does not want them there. And she's not necessarily cruel as much as she's very blunt and doesn't really care if it's not nice. So being that this is 1968, um, the girls end up um, kind of coming, uh, becoming involved with the Black Panther movement. That was very interesting. Um, I don't, I didn't know, I still don't know a lot about the Black Panthers, um, but I, I want to say somewhere along the way, the only thing I remember as a child was that the Black Panthers were a more violent version of the of Martin Luther King Jr.'s, um, his following, whereas Martin Luther uh, King was more of a pacifist. The Black Panthers were much more um, prone to, I almost want to say acts of domestic terror uh, bombings, I think. Um, so when I read, when I saw that the girls were starting to be involved the Black Panthers, I was sort of like, oh, okay. Um, and it was fantastic because they did a lot of wonderful things for the community, which somehow was never taught to me in any history class I ever took. Um, you know, they did uh, breakfasts for uh, people that couldn't provide food for themselves. 
They did a lot of community work. Um, they did a lot of education. So that was fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed this book and I want to read the next one. And I also obviously need to pick up a book about the Black Panther so that I can educate myself properly because I was not taught any of the positive things about the Black Panther. So our school always focused on um, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Panthers were very rarely um, mentioned. And like I said, and if they were, it seems like it was mentioned negatively. So we need to rectify that. Um, so I wanted to give this series a try. So this is Awesome Egyptians from the Horrible Histories um, series. I actually have um, the whole collection. I bought it for my children and it's this really nifty um, collection where the horrible stuff in history is not ignored. Um, it is the author thinks the kids need to know about it. So, um, what do I want to say about this? They seem to be factually accurate. Um, I tried to do some research, but most of the research was about the TV show that was um, from these books and like a spinoff from this book series. And um, I came across a couple of very small articles where they said the whole series only had like seven um, things wrong. So I don't know, just I really should have picked a book um, that I was more familiar with, like um, Tudor history or Regency or something like that. Something that I actually could have read critically instead of e Egyptian history, which I do not know much about. But anyway, so um, this was fun to read. There's a lot of humor, a lot of tongue in cheek, um, and there's a lot of these um, different kinds of characters characters and um, comic strips that sort of give you um, an idea of, of history. Um, but to me, it just didn't, doesn't dive deep enough. It's very light and, but it is, it does have some horrible histories like um, embalming bodies, the way they removed the organs and the tongues and burying people alive and, um, how, um, oh, I was that in here? I want to say it was in here that they, they had to embalm the females differently so that they, um, they were not messed with by the embalmers. And, um, it, the interesting things in here about like the female pharaohs, that they were beards and stuff. So they were like emulating men and they were called, kings or pharaohs they there was not a female um a, a gender uh specific term for a female pharaoh so um yeah this was you know this just wasn't really i think it's a little bit too juvenile for me but it would probably be great for a child that has to read nonfiction for school or is interested um because they're very short and they're very to the point um i just prefer a little bit more than what that author was offering and then we have Taste Like Candy by Ivy Tholen. So this, I love this cover. I love the colors and I, I love skulls. I've got skulls all over the house. So this is a, um, a YA, you know what? I'm going to take that back. I don't think this is YA. The characters are high school students, but I think that this is probably more maybe like a new adult um, because some of the content in here is a little, um, a little much, I think, to be considered a YA. So anyway, so, um, the premise of this book is a group of, um, girls that are about to be seniors. They are, um, <clears throat> let me back up, sorry. The outgoing seniors, the girls put on a scavenger hunt every year for the incoming senior girls. And this year, the scavenger hunt is not going to be at the high school like it always has been. This year, it is at a closed amusement park. Um, and this is a straight-up slasher. If you like 80s, 90s slasher flicks, this one is a really great option for you. Um, it is gory and, and bloody and completely unbelievable, but it was a lot of fun to read. Um, it's a self-published novel, so 
the writing was not fantastic. It was okay. Um, but it was very outlandish. I mean, some of the stuff that happened in here, you, I mean, you're just like, no way, absolutely not. But it was a lot of fun. Um, and I actually went and got her other book, Mall Rats, because <laughs> it was just a lot of fun to read. And I want to read that in October. So I really do recommend this one if you, if you like slasher flicks, that was a good option. Um, oh, the only two books I have left are the two audiobooks. So, um, the first one was Lies by T.M. Logan, and this was a thriller, and it takes place in England, and I didn't really think a, much about this book when I was finished with it. I think I gave it a three-star rating. The narration was fine. The premise was interesting. Um, the main character is with his son. I think his son is like a toddler, maybe a preschool age child. And they deviate from their normal plan. And in doing so, the main character spots his wife at a hotel. And later in the evening, when he asks her about it, she denies it. And the main character starts to sort of poke and scratch at it. And until he starts finding even more suspicious things um, going on with his wife. My biggest issue was the main character to behave in the way that he did. The whole plot hinged on him being a naive nitwit, which I did not enjoy that. Um, I wanted to know what the hell was going on with the wife just as much as the main character. So I, I did keep up with the book. And there was a twist and the ending and all that stuff was, was worth it. So I did enjoy that, but I did not like the character. Um, and he made a lot of decisions that I thought were just like, really, really, that's what you're going to do. Um, but you know, sometimes that happens. Um, so yeah, I ended up giving this a three star rating. I would try another book by this author because you can really tell the author is probably a very good writer. And I think there's a lot of potential that there are some books that he's written that I would really enjoy. And then the last book that I read, I have got to get the little book because I cannot remember. It has a very, very long title. Um, so make sure I tell it to you right. I'd rather be reading The Delights and Dilemmas of a Reading Life by Anne Bogle. So I listened to this on audio and it was absolutely delightful. It was a wonderful experience. Um, I couldn't wait uh, to go to bed at night so I could put my headphones on and listen to this for 30 or 45 minutes where I just relaxed in the dark. Um, this is basically Anne Bogle talking about reading and books and her life. Um, how her reading has changed and there's times in your life where, um, when you look back and, and you can see this, um, the evolution of your reading and she talks about owning books and buying books and bookshops and libraries and reading to your children and, um, a, uh, merging books whenever you, um, marry or move in with your partner. And it's just, like I said, this light, delightful, little cozy book. Um, there's no deep dives into um, a particular book. It just kind of lightly touches on the books um, that she remembers so strongly. Um, so I added some books to my TBR while I was listening to this. And like I said, it was just a really delightful read. I would love to sit down with Ann Bogle and have a cup of coffee and talk about books with her because I think we would be great friends. Um, so I very, very, very much recommend this one. And I love books about books, um, which I think most of us do. So recommend that one. Um, and that is it. So I had a pretty good reading month in August. I enjoyed, I think, most of what I read. Um, I only loved three books, um, which is, you know, what would that be? That would be a third of what I read. 
so not too too bad um and you know I don't usually DNF two books so that was a little a little different um so yeah that's it um let me know if you have any recommendations for YA horror I try to keep my horror kind of light or almost in the unbelievable territory um because I'm a complete wuss I read a book by Nick Cutter a few years ago and I'm still emotionally scarred from that so I don't want anything that's like super super scary because I don't find that relaxing and it just gives me the willies um so that's it so thank you very much for clicking on my video let me know if you've read any of these let me know actually you know what let me know what you read in August that was your favorite I would love to hear about it I'm always looking to add books to my TBR and that's a, you know, it's a great way to do it. So thank you. Bye.